This episode is made possible by Stack Adapt. Marketers, Stack Adapt has just the thing to get you back on your design team's good side with a creative builder in Stack Adapt. You can build multiple ad creatives in many sizes, many sizes, any you want, really, any size you want, in just a few clicks. Plus, make real time edits to your creatives right in the Stack Adapt platform. Don't know why I'm yelling. I'm very excited about it. Learn more at go.stackadapt.com slash creative builder. I have to calm down. Hello, everyone, and thanks for hanging out with us for the Behind the Numbers Weekly Listen, the marketer podcast made possible by Stack Adapt. This is the Friday show that will patiently wait for Oscar to go and change before we actually start the show. Oscar? Why? Because the faithful are I am impressed faithful, to be no honest. That's, what. That's what it's about. I respect that. I respect that. that. Yeah. Uh, this is also the show that sent Ethan the runner show 10 minutes before recording and got sent back the dumpster fire emoji. You know, I had, I had sort of assumed that maybe we were going to talk about the Super Bowl, but uh, it would have been nice to have some information ahead of time. Yes, Stuart. That was my fault entirely. I'm Marcus Johnson, who's fully responsible in today's show. Takeaways from the big game. We dissect the new giant sports streaming service yet to be properly announced. And I have some facts about trees. Join me for this episode. We have three people less meet than we start. With our director of forecasting based in New York City, it's Oscar Orozco. Hello, Marcus. It's been a while. Happy to be back. Yeah, welcome. I'd... Welcome back. Did you have to wear that? <laughs> Thank Did you. Have You're money from on New York. Of course. You're not even from I mean, the Bay Area. We are f- faithful. I can't with you. All right. We're also joined by. It, it doesn't matter. You know, <laughs> Don't 49ers listen to them, fans Oscar. are. This is what you're supposed to be doing. <laughs> We're also joined by uh, Max Willens. He is one of our senior analysts covering everything digital advertising and media based in Philadelphia. Yo. We finally have our principal forecasting writer, uh, also based in New York. It's Ethan Kramer Flood. Marcus, I'm sorry I couldn't be your Valentine this year, but I appreciate you still having me on. You're half welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what do we have in store for you today? Uh, takeaways from the big game. We'll start there, of course. We then move to uh, a Super Bowl edition of What's the Point? Our contestants try to win make-believe points, and uh, we give them, a, I guess, a Lombardi trophy. Uh, and then we end with some facts about trees. There'll be some other stuff as well, so that might be worth sticking around for. The tree stuff, probably not. Uh, okay, we start, of course, with the story of the week. Takeaways from the big game. The Kansas City Chiefs just beat the San Francisco 49ers in a thrilling overtime win in Super Bowl 58 in Las Vegas. Uh, Only the second Super Bowl ever to see overtime. uh, And 123 million people tuned in to the game, according to Nielsen and Adobe Analytics preliminary figures, making it America's most watched TV show of all time. That 123 million is up 7% from last year. Great news for advertisers who were spending about $7 million on average for a 30-second ad slot at the game, and that's just for the ad slot. Uh, Jeremy Goldman points out that they also have to pay to make the ad, so total costs can come close to uh, $20 million for that 30 seconds of airtime. But we start with our first question, gents. Um, I want to ask you two in this segment. One is going to be your takeaway from the game. The second, your favorite ad. We start with uh, takeaway from the Super Bowl, Max. I guess I would start with, um, you know, it's funny you you point out the high costs that uh, brands often incur paying for their Super Bowl ads uh, because Timu apparently decided the hell with paying big money for the spot itself. I'm just going to spend all that money buying all the airtime I possibly can. And that seems to have worked. Um, Mm. I've seen a bunch of research suggesting that the uh, number of post ad searches uh, by spot uh, was tabulated and Timu won going away. And, you know, I think that there's something to be said for, you know, people have been aware for over a decade that Super Bowl airtime is really expensive 
And I think that the notion of spending, buying multiple spots for something so simple is really kind of powerful. So I feel like in a weird way, Timu kind of won the Super Bowl, uh, even though they aired inarguably the cheapest looking Super Bowl ad in the history of Super Bowl ads. <laughs> Yeah, they it's a lot of money up front, but there there was some Kansar research saying Super Bowl ads in 2022 had an ROI of five dollars for every dollar spent. And so it, it it seems like they get that back and then some in terms of their return on investment. So well worth it. Um, was it three? Did they run three times? That's what I remember. At least. Maybe I four. think I think 20, it was five, five. But that that might have been the uh I was very tired watching. The game, but it's definitely, out. I think it was more than three. I feel confident about that. There yeah, maybe twenty-eight. Maybe million. maybe a few few too many in the end. I don't know if that was needed. <laughs> I also noticed there were uh, like very few automakers. Like it's just something you you've come accustomed to seeing. So uh, auto brands mm, and and I point. just really remember the Volkswagen commercial. It was one of my faves. We'll get to mm -hmm. that, I'm sure, mm -hmm. but not much else. Really? Okay. Um, Ethan, take away. Uh, well, unfortunately, uh, the biggest takeaway is probably that if you want to have an incredibly successful Super Bowl for everyone involved, you have the Kansas City Chiefs play, uh, which is just like I'll, I'll speak for a significant cohort of sports fans and just say I could not be more sick of them. Uh, and that's just <laughs> not that's not just because of this year and all of the ancillary things going on around them. I would have said that last year, too. It's just so annoying that after dealing with the Patriots for however, however long now, we just have another team and that we just have to watch them every time and they win all the time. And but that works out, right? They're, they do spectacular numbers. Everyone could not be more delighted. I guess the game was actually exciting. It was a pretty terrible game for a while there. By the end, if you were still awake, it was it was quite exciting. You know, one thing I'd say going back to the ads, though, I thought there were too many celebrity cameos. I think we've moved a little bit away from like the narrative, a plot. You know, it's 30 seconds. Yeah. But it's just the kind of plot, you know, plopping them in the middle of commercials and thinking that works. Maybe it does. I haven't seen any data on that, but... No, this well, lot. I do have some numbers on that. And so what you're saying is a trend that has been happening for apparently for the last 10 years. And I hadn't noticed it, but when you point it out, it's like, oh no, that is definitely true. So celebrities dominating Super Bowl ads from 2010 to today, the share of ads with celebrities in them has gone from 30% to close to 70. This was um, referenced in the Wall Street Journal. Um, so from 30% of ads having celebrities to now 70, the share of ads featuring featuring multiple celebrities, you won't be shocked to learn, has exploded from around 5% to about 40 during that time, 4-0. Why? One, um, celebrity-infused celebrity ads, makes uh, they make for good for social media uh, content, shareable content after the fact. But two, it's what young people like to see, apparently. Jeremy, Jeremy Goldman, who writes for our briefing, pointing out in January, there was an Ad Age Harris poll uh, study, a survey that suggested 53% of Gen Zers favored star-studded ads versus just over 40 percent for the overall population so apparently appealing to the young people i'd love to know who gen z was thinking about when they mentioned like they like seeing celebrities i do not imagine it was zach braff and uh uh oh my god what's his name uh, uh those, those guys those guys have yeah, a whole side business now they, they have a whole this is like a second career really and truly <laughs> But uh, um, don't know a lot of Zoomers who are all about <laughs> Donald Faison and Zach Braff and Jason Momoa. Uh, <laughs> what are the good also, also, um Usher was in three or four ads for yeah. different brands. Mm -hmm. I don't remember mm -hmm. that. I mean, obviously, there's a reason they all went after him. That makes sense and everything. Yeah. But the idea of having a similar a, a celebrity pop up again and again and again, promoting all different kinds of things. Right. That's, who was exactly tied to the halftime show. Um, that was pretty cool. Uh, but Jeremy makes a good point, though. He says celebrity heavy Super Bowl ads, while attention grabbing, risk overshadowing the brand. There was some research from System One Group showing about 20% of Super Bowl ad viewers walk away unable to recall the advertiser brand because they're so focused on the celebrity or celebrities. So you do have to be careful um, about that. Um, real quick from me, I, the takeaway I had was uh, it, it's becoming even more of a must advertise event than, than ever before. I, I'm surprised it's only $7 million to be perfectly honest um, because of the size of the audience. The Super Bowl has twice the number of viewers, at least 2023, twice the number of viewers um, as the second most watched TV program, which was also, it was the um, AFC championship game. 
uh, between the last year's last last year's 2023. So it was like 2022 seasons, but if you take full calendar year, 2023 Super Bowl was number one over a hundred, 115 million last year. And then uh, about half of that for the second place um, program. Um, Super Bowl has drawn over a hundred million viewers for nine of the last 10 years. Um, so that's one. Secondly, the halftime show, uh, Usher's Super Bowl halftime show drew 30 million households. According to numbers from Samba TV, that's up 5% from last year's Super Bowl halftime show. Um, and also just the, the demographics, more balanced demographic than you might expect. According to Nielsen, women make up 37% of viewers for regular season NFL games, but 47% of last year's Super Bowl audience. So I, mean, I, I, can, must have. I can verify that right away because... My disdain for the Chiefs is so significant when combined with being utterly exhausted by Sunday night, I had I had a uh, a whole weekend full of wedding related festivities. Shout out to uh, Ted and Nicole. Um, by Sunday yes. night, I would have been just as happy to like not even watch this thing, even though I knew that was a bad idea considering my job. But my <laughs> girlfriend wasn't having it, you know, and she doesn't particularly care about the NFL, but mm -hmm. like she was not going to allow us to just skip the Super Bowl. And I was like, okay, okay. She's right. half of that relationship I, right I there. I guess I'll, See, I'll do a better job on the podcast thanks to this insistence. <laughs> favorite ads, gents, before we close out the story of the week real quick. Oscar? Yeah, I mean, I of course I'm going to mention the, the messy Dan Marino Michelob Ultra commercial, right? I mean, that, come on, with the GOAT of soccer, uh, it, was, it was epic to see Messi finally get his first Super Bowl mm -hmm. commercial. So I wouldn't have been able to one. remember the brand, though. I was so focused on Messi that I, I couldn't <laughs> and, remember and the what smile. the... The, the billion-dollar smile, so handsome. Yep. Uh, Ethan, yes, his favorite. Well, so I mean, I got. Let me let me answer two because the noteworthy one I sure. think we should mention. So my favorite one was just Deadpool three. Give me that, right? That was like the very first one, right? Right around mm -hmm. kickoff, right? But that's probably not what everyone's going to remember. But that's that's what I was most like to see. But we should probably mention the Snapchat one. I thought that was really interesting mm -hmm. as part of this new uh, attempted rebrand away from social media. Uh, although grammatically questionable presentation. I don't know if anybody else noticed that. It was just, they, were, they were just, yeah, yeah. No, go check it That's out. Go one. check it out. No, I'm not okay. going to tell you. You didn't notice. Mm -mm. Grammatically questionable, but clearly making an effort to separate themselves from all the negative attention around social media by declaring that they are not social media uh, and trying to get everyone to sort of buy into that, which, you know, I was thinking in my head, like, imagine if we took Snapchat off off of all of our charts and graphs and tables about social media. I imagine they'd call us the next day and say, why did you delete us? And we say, well, you said you're not social media, so we're not going to cover you anymore. Like, no, but, you know, they they were really they're making a big push in that direction, which I thought yeah. was interesting. And they, they spent a lot of money to try to get that into everybody's heads. Now, it wasn't like my favorite ad, yeah. um, but it's one that stuck. And but sorry, I'm going to say one more thing. OK, um, um, the absence of the single hottest topic of the year I thought was interesting. In the past, we've seen uh, nothing but say crypto related ads when everything was crypto. And this year I thought there would be more AI, more gen AI stuff since that's mm -hmm. all that everyone is talking about all year wrong. And there was one, right? There was a Microsoft mm -hmm. Copilot ad the and AI that's all there was. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then when that came on, I was like, oh yeah. We've seen nothing about AI the way yeah. in the past that whatever the hottest topic is tends yeah. to dominate that year. So those are the three things came up. But, you know, Deadpool all the way. Yeah. Um, Max? Uh, I hate to double dip, but for me, it's the the Timu one. Because as it was playing out, I was like, what the hell is this? And then as it was going on, I thought, no, this is actually brilliant. Um, because this is just the, the biggest flex on planet earth that you can just be like we took an ad that's should run in the middle of it of your your match game on mobile boom <laughs> oh also we're gonna do it three more times you know <laughs> so that was my favorite one nice um two, two real quick from me one was i mean you mentioned gen ai it was about it was a discover ad with jennifer coolidge and it, i thought it was interesting because as everyone is kind of zigging it seemed like they went to zag by basically saying uh you you'll get to speak to a person you know yeah. you won't just get a chat bot or an automated message if you call us um and it was a joking with jennifer college trying to figure out whether the person on the end of the phone was a robot or not saying uh that they should or that they were telling her to prove that she wasn't one and i thought that was interesting because everyone's going towards gen ai but that was kind of a pivot away from it and the other one was um 
uh, the Hard Knock Life Dove commercial. I thought it was quite powerful. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Forty five percent of girls they said quit sport by age fourteen in large part because of mm -hmm. body confidence. Um, right. So I thought that was yeah quite an enlightening um, ad as well. Uh, all right, folks. I feel that's like they've had they've had ads uh, for a number of years, a few years now. At least I remember one last year. Yeah, so yeah, to that. see that repeat it. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Uh, that's what we've got time for for the story of the week. Uh, congratulations to Kansas City for winning the Super Bowl. Sorry no, to no, Oscar. No, no, don't say that. Yeah, no. yeah, definitely put that in. <laughs> just, uh, just delete that. Time now for our very own Super Bowl. It's the game of the week. Today's game. What's the point? Three team Super Bowl style. Oh. What does that mean? I'll tell you. Glad you asked. Where I read out four questions related to one huge story that just broke uh, in the sports streaming world surrounding a brand new sports streaming service from ESPN, Fox, and Warner Brothers Discovery. Okay, answers get one point. Good answers get two. And answers that give you the same feeling as, I guess, throwing a game-winning touchdown in overtime. Answers that leave you with that feeling, not not the feeling that Oscar had because of that, but other people. Um, they'll get you three points. Each person gets 30 seconds to answer before they hear the bell. If you run long, then I'm going to throw a yellow flag. Literally. A couple of options here. This one's kind of mustard colored. I don't know what's Kind of dirty. Yeah, I know. I think that was used to wash the car. But I brought some other <laughs> options as well, just in case we've got this one. Got a pattern. Right. That's fun. This one's a lot, this is kind of mainly white, actually, so I probably shouldn't have brought that one. Um, but yeah, the penalty flag will get thrown, literally. If you, uh, if you, if you go long, is the point of that. Uh, folks watching the, about a visual medium. Yeah, folks watching the video podcast, all 12 <laughs> people watching the video podcast will see us happen, as well as the folks on the episode. Everyone else will have no idea what's happening, but I'll, I'll provide an audio cue as well, letting you know what's going on. Most points wins and gets the very underappreciated last word. All right, so before we start, what's the story? Uh, so the story behind our four questions for today, in a surprise announcement, ESPN, Fox, and Warner Brothers Discovery said they will combine their sports content into a sports uh, super sports streaming service by this coming fall, right in time for the NFL and NBA seasons. The new streaming products will combine 14 linear networks across Fox, ESPN, and Warner Brothers Discovery, including channels like ABC, ESPN, FS1, TNT, the SEC Network, etc. The new service will include content from the NFL, NBA, WNBA, MLB, NHL, college sports, NASCAR, and more. Uh, no name yet. Pricing details uh, also don't exist thus far um all right gents let's move to the first quarter clever uh, and this is all about the partners the partners that are involved in this uh, fox espn and warner brothers discovery so i'll start with max which of the which of these three partners does this joint sports streaming service benefit the most i think i would say that it's probably news corp and fox um they were in sort of a weird spot um where the pace of cord cutting was probably pretty bad for them. So late last year, uh, FS1 surpassed ESPN as the uh, most subscribed to cable channel, which on some level was, you know, a huge dream come true for them because they had been sort of slowly but surely building this ESPN killer for years and years. But they kind of got to the place that they wanted to get to just as the bottom was starting to drop out of the linear TV uh, universe. And as far as I can tell, they had not really laid a ton of groundwork for an FS1 streaming product. And so launching this thing sort of allows them to put this product on equal footing with ESPN, with um, uh, Bleacher Report and, and WBD's uh, sports properties. And so they get to sort of tick the box of, you know, they managed to beat ESPN in terms of cable subs, and now they are on this uh, equal level playing field as a legitimate sports brand that, you know, can hopefully continue to, to monetize in, in some form or fashion as the next generation of sports media gets uh, put together. It wasn't even kind of close to 30 seconds. And so we throw the flag. You know, that's fair. That was on tight the ship. How did it even that's land fair. on I'm sorry. Ceiling? One second. I hadn't thought this through. One I wasn't even watching the clock. I thought he did a great job. It was he good. Did. He went really long. Retrieved but the deduct flag. points. We're trying to win here. Yeah, he does. Yeah, he does. He does lose points. Great answer, but uh, the hat to throw the flag. Delay of game on the offense. 
See what I've done? Uh, Ethan. <laughs> Very unimpressed. Um, Ethan, you're next. That, well, that was a good answer. I'll just take a different one because what not, I was going to say Warner Brothers, um, if only because they needed a win. I mean, you're talking about a company that's been in an enormous amount of financial difficulties, enormous amount of debt problems, and their sports properties were probably the most at risk in terms of maintaining the, the cost that it's going to take to maintain their NBA coverage, which is sort of the top of the mountain for them. That was at risk. And now it probably isn't right. This is probably going to solve the issue. They're going to, they're going to all be able to bid together uh, and they're going to probably be able to keep what they have thanks to hitching their wagon to this. And it's probably going to be a big win. Um, and my sense is that they needed a, a win, a big win more than the other two. Yeah, I I am interested in whether they're going to be able to to bid together. Um because uh I'm surprised so the NFL and the NBA they weren't involved in the creation of this new venture. Um they were kind of left out in the cold and just informed about this right before. Um but uh the Wall Street Journal pointed out apparently ESPN Fox and Warner Brothers Discovery say the new service won't violate any current agreements with the NFL or NBA or traditional pay TV distributors. Um the league's obviously going to come through the details and make sure that's true. But um, yeah, I was wondering whether this yeah, means... Yeah, but that's current deals, right? So the big issue right now is not the NFL because th those are set. It's the NBA right. thing that's expiring and but everyone's I wonder going to, if... to really pony up next year. But I wonder if in that deal, it says something like, you know, you, you can't you can't do this. You can't join forces uh, and, and get together. Because well, yeah, I mean, for, for, for current deals, you're right. It's set for future deals or, or pending deals like the NBA. Um, I wonder if they're now going to have fewer buyers or whether those three are going to roll up it into one. Yeah, Another it's, it's got to be an advantage for them because if you think about it from the NBA's perspective, now there's a risk to them to not be on this, right? So this, yes. this is this is a good this yeah. is a good move no matter what, whether or not they can sort of collectively bargain and bring down the price because they're now they're only going to be they're not going to be bidding against each other as much. It's like you know Amazon or whoever instead of having lots of people all bidding they'll be able to put their heads together, I assume. And even if they can't, it's not like the NBA is going to want to relegate itself to only being on Amazon. They're going to want to be on this. Yeah. Executives say um, that uh, the the plan isn't to, to, to negotiate together and they are going to negotiate separate uh, rights deals. Um, we'll see if that ends up happening. Um, but it does, yeah, it does feel like there might be some some antitrust concerns down the road, perhaps for them, uh, because of how big this service is going to. It seems like it could be, and, and the bidding and the negotiating potential as well from the from a combined trio. Uh, Oscar. Yeah, I mean, I I agree actually with Ethan. I think it's it's got to be WBD, um, and I think the timing is good for them with this new Bleacher Report sort of added tier and extra money to access different sports content it kind of overshadows that news a little bit I, I also think yeah from the content perspective they've had less to offer men's and women's national team soccer you know a little bit of this and that so I think on the monetization side when you think of ad revenues it opens up much more ad inventory for them uh in in this situation I think if it's split you know mm -hmm. um three ways Okay, let's move to the second quarter. We're talking about the stakeholders, the other stakeholders, the external ones. Uh, Ethan, we'll start with you. Which other external stakeholder will this affect the most? Well, other than the sports leagues themselves that are going to be dealing with the question that we just discussed, mm -hmm. I, I guess it's Comcast and you know <laughs> there are the and you know the uh, CBS and the the folks that just aren't a part of this now. Um, that you know the the folks who still are going to have more of their wagon hitched to the traditional cable bundle as this increasingly, I mean, when this news broke, sorry, I know it's 30 seconds here, but when this news broke, we knew it was just a monumental announcement, it, right? Mm -hmm. Right in the beginning, it was like a four sentences, you know, came out of the announcement and we're already all over in Slack, like, oh, this is enormous. This is gigantic. It doesn't solve all the problems for all of us sports fans. We can talk about that later. Um, but it seems to me that you know, this is just going to accelerate all the problems for anyone who hasn't sort of figured out their next step. And if yeah. you're not part of this party, where are you? Yeah. Um, Oscar. It's a good point, Ethan. I mean, for me, uh, again, the, the obvious one were the leagues. I, I started to think about the Amazons, the Netflixes, the Googles, like the tech companies and their play in all of this. 
uh, how it can potentially benefit them um, if if the the other guys, the media conglomerates, are negotiating as one, right? So they've been angling to get more involved in sports uh, programming, and so it does seemingly create an angle for them there. So that's who I thought about. Okay, nice, Max. I I decided to go one step uh, outside or a, a, a concentric circle outside, and I thought about the guys who several years ago sort of fancied themselves as future kind of OTT sports brands like Fubo and DAZN, who are now basically DOA. I mean, DAZN has kind of pivoted into boxing and um, combat sports and, and things like that. But, you know, any kind of dream that they might have had of becoming the sort of sports OTT destination of the future, that's that's over. This is the mm -hmm. new thing now. Um, how it stacks up against the tech companies as, as Oscar and Ethan both mentioned is a, is a, an open question, but the, those guys are, are done. Yeah. Um, yeah. Fubo TV, their shares dropped 20% um, after this news. Uh, not a great sign. Um, okay. It's time for the half time uh, scores four, four and four. So all tied up. We'll do a quick, uh, probably about a 10 seconds of an Usher song under fair use for your <laughs> half time show. <laughs> Okay, now that's out of the way. Let's move on. We've got a uh, third quarter coming up. Uh, Oscar's going to kick us off for this one. The most surprising twist. So Oscar, what's going to be the most surprising twist coming out of this new uh, super streaming service announcement? You could say it's the most surprising, but it's not. I mean, you know, it, it's obviously going to cut more people to uh, or drive more people to cut the cord. But the most surprising twist or not surprising one would be the sort of recreation of cable TV in a 21st century type of way, right? So uh, it really does depend on, like, as you said, Marcus, earlier, we have no idea on price. Uh, at, at first, I'm sure it'll be pretty reasonable, but eventually it's probably going to mirror the price that people are paying for cable and satellite now. So uh, mm -hmm. that remains to be seen, but that'll be the most ironic twist I, I could <laughs> think of coming out of this. It's a good one. Max? Uh, I think what it's going to be is uh, the one of the outsiders looking in here uh, in the form of Comcast launching some kind of super mega uh, soccer content uh, products mm. quite recently. Uh, Bundesliga, they, they renewed their rights to the Premier League quite recently. Um, Bundesliga is, I, I think they, uh, ESPN wants to renew, but they haven't yet. Mm -hmm. And um, I could soccer. see... Mm -hmm uh comcast basically putting a stake in the ground and saying the one sport you guys don't have a huge stranglehold on is soccer it's an ascendant sport in the united states um we'll take that thank you mm -hmm. nice ethan so i want to see what ends up happening i don't know if this is a surprise because i don't know what's going to happen but i guess the biggest question i have that could involve a surprise twist is what's going to happen with the dominant regional sports networks that are out there mm -hmm. that are actually carrying the vast majority of the games that a very significant chunk of sports fans are actually want to watch, right? The, a large percentage of sports fans care more about their team than they do about the sport in general. And while this product will obviously be the leading provider of sports in general, it's not going to have all the Knicks games on that I want to watch. Mm -hmm. It's not going to have all the Yankees games mm -hmm. that I want. It's not going to have hardly any of the Knicks games I want to watch. And it's not going to have hardly any of the Yankees games that I want to watch. And a lot of people are like me, right? This is a fairly common way that people engage with sports. They care about their teams. What's going to happen with all that? We're still going to be stuck with our cable bundle for those, which means now we're paying a whole lot more because we're probably going to want this. But maybe we won't want this because if we're stuck with the cable bundle just so we can get MSG and yes, that's a New York story, but everyone is like that in Boston, Philly and other places also. And, and you know, wh where does that leave us? How do we make this decision? And then so the potential surprising twist that comes out of this is maybe something will happen with that. Somebody will step up some kind of regional sports net bundle something because mm -hmm. even though those are those are cash cows for the big teams, um, you know, they don't want to be left behind either. And right now, like, you know, paying for the MSG app doesn't make it. It's like thirty dollars or something like, you know, something is going to have to change on this huge, huge chunk that is is not addressed. Another flag. That was long. It's thrown for Ethan. But it was this, this is a top point, mind though. for really me because point. I got this is what I gotta deal with. <laughs> Episode interference. <laughs> worked no? on this. Okay, like let's it. move on. Sorry, Max. I said you worked on these. I like it. You I actually the... didn't work on that. That just I just <laughs> brilliant. So thank you. 
Thanks, Oscar. How have you got more points all of a sudden? Points, um, yeah. yeah, no, to your point, though, quickly, um, Ethan, yeah, it doesn't fix the fragmented sports viewing problem entirely at all. And then there's a journal article pointing out, if you're a really big NFL fan, it says, this new service would give you only a portion of the games that you may want to see, since you will need Amazon for Thursday Night Football, Paramount Plus for access to CBS's Sunday afternoon games, and NBC Universal's Peacock for Sunday Night Football. So it's definitely not um, fixed uh, everything uh, for the consumer. Uh, we moved to double points, uh, double points fourth quarter. Uh, everyone's actually tied. Sorry, Oscar. Uh, oh. But uh, yeah, everyone's tied uh, going into Math double points fourth sense. quarter. <laughs> the super, the super sports streaming platform success is where we finish. Uh, so we go back to Max. Despite limited details, Max, how successful do you think this new platform will be out of 10? If they can keep... Uh, the next media rights package for a, a major sport from going to YouTube or Netflix or Amazon, the answer is 10. Uh, this was basically a defensive move, oh. I would say, that these guys made. And um, if it succeeds on that on those terms, then it is it is a success. Okay. Ethan? I'm going to hedge also um, and say that it could be a 9 or 10, but what they have to do is con control the sticker, sticker shock element. If they're able to not have this be just a shockingly expensive service. Yeah, I think it's going to be an easy nine or 10, at least over the sort of medium, near to medium term. And then mm -hmm. things are going to keep changing. But yeah. uh, they might not be able to control the sticker shock element, in which case we'll see. They'll become very interesting for those of us that are going to want to spend our money to watch our, you know, our local teams. Yeah. Um, on that point, quickly, Oscar, before you go, there are some details about, well, not some details, some, some predictions about the price. Research company Lightshed Partners predicts that a subscription will start at $35 a month with ads. Wells Fargo analyst Stephen Cahill, uh, Cahill thinks the service could break even if approximately 6 million subscribers signed up at 40 dollars a month and other analysts have the price at closer to 50 bucks a month or higher um but it depends on so many things estimated signups uh the rising cost of sports rights etc oscar it's always gonna have ads i mean this these are sports yep. so there's not isn't it, you know, no one's gonna pay to get rid of the ads but i think under 50 dollars would be a success yeah that would, to me that seems that would be it feels a little steep to me but yes mm. absolutely and i mean i think that you pay like a million dollars a month for cable what do you mean <laughs> by the way i got rid of cable no you didn't I, I wow. yes yes i am officially a cord cutter but uh but because of that i'm very price sensitive now and uh it feels a little high but we'll You've see changed. maybe in the long term <laughs> um well, in terms of my answer, I mean, I'm I'm with the the fellers here. <laughs> I'm at ten out of ten, eleven out of ten. How could you not be excited? Eleven. Bob Iger talked about pulling sports into the future, and there are already rumors about how the system, the platform, excuse me, could incorporate things like sports betting and fantasy and statistics and dynamic visuals and even shopping. How could you not be excited about that? Because it doesn't exist now. So uh, I'm I'm very bullish on this. Okay. I just thought one other thing that we should probably mention is that all of these players are going to have the opportunity to offer this service as part of a bundle. So that's that's a yes. cost control mechanism. If you're thinking as about, well, you know, yeah. you've got your Disney Plus and you've got your Hulu, you know, this thing will come into it. It'll cost more, but it'll cost less than it would if you just bought it on its own. And they're all going to have mm -hmm. all this kind of stuff going on. So yeah. there's going to be lots of different elements to track and there are ways to uh, avoid shocking people with how much it costs. Mm -hmm. And that's why my thoughts on the 8 million subscribers, I mean, I think their plans are probably m much higher than that. You'd have to yeah. think for, for it to be successful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how much, uh, how many sports, uh, what share of sports will the new service include? City analysts expect the new super sports streaming service to encompass about 55% of US sports rights. Uh, no, it's Joe Flint and Isabella Simonetti of the Wall Street Journal, uh, which, as I mentioned, begs the question, will this even go through? Will there be antitrust concerns, government looking at this saying, how is this really going to benefit the consumer? Um, but yeah, sports uh, continues to reign supreme. 93 of America's 100 most watched broadcasts last year, unsurprisingly, were sports. There, there um, can't be any antitrust concerns in the near term because all this stuff is still going to be on TV. True. Right, so this is more more true. further down the road. Mm -hmm. so true. Yep. Spot on. Uh, all right, folks, let's go to the scores. This week's winner, we don't need overtime. Oscar is this week's winner of the Super Bowl. With that jacket on. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah, I know. It was, Thank you. It's because you guys ran long. Multiple flags, multiple true. penalties. Penalties loses games. Defense wins games. Same thing. Uh, Oscar, you won. Congratulations to you. You get Thank the you Lombardi trophy.
and uh it's been a while last... since we've had it 95 but uh whatever <laughs> gives me an opportunity to show this off again you know let me just say very quickly a lot of a lot of questions did shanahan cough it up again should we have run it yes. more in the third yes um you know yes yes we're the third you know the fifth team to win three straight super bowls in a row yes yes but you know who opens up as favorites next season the 49ers no we'll be back I saw that. As exactly. favorites? As their favorite. That's fa right. Yeah, That's yeah. right. He's Congratulations back. to Oscar. He sure. gets the, the pity trophy, if you will. Uh, <laughs> is that what this is? <laughs> of course not. Uh, it's time now for dinner party. A very quick uh, edition of dinner party data. This is the part of the show where we quickly tell you about the most interesting thing we've learned this week in 45 seconds or less, Oscar. We start with Max to set the table. Set a good example, Max. I'll do my best. Uh, it being the beginning of the year, I uh, am trying to sort of think about uh, cool travel things that I can squeeze into 2024. And that got me thinking that I thought the listeners of this show don't give a crap about my travel, but they would like to hear oh, stats about travel. And so I thought about the Hajj, which is the, uh, as I guess everyone knows, but I'll just say the pilgrimage that uh, Muslims are expected to make at least once in their lifetimes if they have the means to do so. Um, and I read a stat that, that completely blew my mind. Um, so as you might expect, the Hajj generates a lot of uh, extra waste um, and presses down harder uh, in its environmental footprint. So uh, in 2011, I think, uh, the Hajj generated 4,700 tons of municipal solid waste um, in Mecca every day. <laughs> By 2040, um, if the kind of number of people going and migrating for this uh, continues to grow, they think it could grow to 44 million tons a day. Um, so that's incredible and gross. But what is um, the solution, Max? That's, yeah. If that is go, a great question recycle. because Saudi Arabia does not have any kind of recycling uh, infrastructure oh. at all. And they mm -hmm. appear not to be terribly interested in building any. But I guess if you, you know, essentially live in a desert, the answer is just dig some sand up and throw the, the, the crap uh, down into the hole you've just dug. But Hide the trash. That's not the answer. It might be. That's what we do with landfill. Um, Ethan. Uh, all right, I got a quick one. I'm going to it, bring it back to the Super Bowl. Uh, so Usher, you know, did a great job. So I, I wanted to just find out the numbers. Um, Usher has had 18 top 10 hits, including nine number one hits and 53 total songs in the Billboard Hot 100 over the span of his career. I am more aware of songs like Yeah and, you know, DJ Got Us Fallen In Love and all these kinds of like bangers that are, are more in line of what you might listen to on your own. Obviously, he's got a whole lot of like semi hits that are in that very particular romantic R&B style that I don't mm. listen to. Uh, but the man's a killer. He's got tons have. and tons and tons of hits. <laughs> I, I, I didn't know a few of them. I have to admit, I didn't know a few of them. Um, nine number one hits. Good job, Usher. You are still relevant. Underrated. He's underrated. Yeah, That's maybe he was it. in my head. I was like, is this guy a megastar? I'm like, oh yeah, he is a megastar. Oscar, you're up. Are you up? <laughs> You're up. All right. So I came across a report from the lovely people at Get Jerry, um, and it piqued my interest because it was about safe driving and smartphone OS choices. But what most interest, interested me is as, as an avid Android loyalist and user and apologist, whenever there's a study that speaks to our superiority, I want to talk about it. So let me tell you what it's about. Mm -hmm. um, it's about you know, dr safe driving and smartphone OS choices. But we know the, the reason that I'm interested in this is because it's no secret really that iPhone users tend to look down at us and people carrying oh, yeah. people. Yes, mm -hmm. let's just say it. Let's just say you said it, not me. Uh, studies have found that some iPhone users, uh, they tend to, they say that they don't want to message people who don't have an iPhone. <laughs> and have you, I've even seen a study that said they don't want to date anyone who owns an, oh iPhone, an Android device. Can you believe this? Can you believe this? So, oh, this absolutely. Study, I can believe that. Yeah, well, there you go. Uh, Max is a little quiet over there. Sorry, Ethan's Max, like, I would never. Judging. I would never date someone. <laughs> so, uh, you know, long story short, they, short, they analyzed the driving behavior of 20,000 drivers. Uh, that It was about 13 million kilometers of driving. And they found that Android users outperform iPhone carrying counterparts uh, on the road. Uh, they achieve higher safety driving scores than iPhone users in every single category. That's safe driving, speeding, 
distraction, turning and braking and accelerating. Uh, and the widest margin was in the distraction category, which means that Android users don't drive and use their phone at the same time, uh, while iPhone users do. Uh, so what accounts for the different scores? It's not clear, the data doesn't say, but perhaps it's the personalities, uh, other personality studies have found, right? That Android fans are more conscientious, they tend to exhibit higher levels of honesty. Yeah, I can uh, see that. And, you know, they're just less emotional and consistent and predictable. And I can just go on mm -hmm. and on and on. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, Android Great dinner people. party data. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> you blow my mind, Oscar. Facts about trees. Here we go. Uh, forests cover about 30% of Earth's land. You'll be fascinated to learn. Or not. Uh, okay, what else do we have here? Um... <laughs> Russia has the most forest. Uh, after a it, slow start. <laughs> it accounts for about 20% of the world's total is in Russia. Russia. And about half of Russia is actually covered by forest. Seems difficult to move around. Brazil has the second most forest area with 12%. Brazil's forested area is almost twice the size of Saudi Arabia, which is the 12th largest country in the world. So Brazil's got a fair amount. Canada used to have a lot more. Sorry to interrupt. Just no, it did. Yeah, that's true. Um, that's very true. Canada is third with 9%. The US, we have 8% of the world's forest. China uh, is in fifth with 6%. The top five countries by forest area, Russia, Brazil, Canada, America, and China account for over half of the world's forests, but just one third of the world's land, uh, total land mass. And then finally, a showstopper uh, because of better technology and satellite imagery uh, it's given us more accurate estimates on the global tree population there are an estimated three trillion trees just over in the world according to a study in the journal nature that means there are 422 trees for every person on the planet canadians those lucky devils have close to 9,000 trees for every canadian you should have just you should have led the podcast with this. I mean, this is just killer stuff. <laughs> it's gold, isn't it? V, well, just that, cut everything else out. Been, just put this in. Would have been expected the Canadian the data point. But you know, four, what was it? Four twenty-two. That doesn't sound that bad. Four hundred trees right. each, basically. Yeah. yeah so you each get nice. four hundred trees. Choose well. Interesting. All right. All right. Okay. Get us out of here. <laughs> oh, my God. I v, if you put a tumbleweed in this part, I will be furious. <laughs> what was that, Oscar? I like that one. It was a good one. So you're only saying uh, that because I made you the I'm champion not, of the game of the week. But but I appreciate that. Happened. I don't need to suck up. Anymore. All right, that's true. No, yeah, no. thanks for that. Uh, let's end on that note. Uh, thank you so much to my guests. <laughs> thank you to Max. Always a pleasure, Marcus. Thank you. Thank you to Ethan. <laughs> Always fun. Thank you to Oscar. Good to be back. Thanks for having me, Marcus. Yes, indeed. Congratulations to you as well uh, for winning the Super Bowl game of the week. Uh, thanks to Victoria, who edits the show. James, who copy edits it. Stuart, who runs the team. Sophie, who does our social media. And Lance, who runs our video podcast. Thanks to everyone for listening in. Uh, you can find us on Instagram if you want. One word, Insider Intelligence, for behind-the-scenes content. Uh, we hope to see you on Tuesday for the Behind the Numbers Daily and eMarketer podcast made possible by Stack Adapt. Happy long President's Day weekends.